Well, hello, I'm Jeff Cook with Taylor County Extension, and this is Backyard Basics. And down here is my co-host for the month, Flat Aiden. Flat Aiden is, a, uh, I guess, a replica of my nephew who lives up in Washington, D.C. Um, as a school project, they, they sent out Flat themselves to family members and relatives across around the world, across the country, to go on an adventure. It's based off a book, many of y'all probably know, of Flat Stanley, who was squashed by, I think, a, a bulletin board or a chalkboard. They made, made him flat, and uh, being flat, let him go on some pretty crazy adventures. So I guess my nephew, being from the big city of Washington, D.C., he wanted to come out to the country and uh, and get some get some different experiences. So he's been hunting, been on a peanut picker, a cotton picker, a peanut combine. Uh, so he's done a lot of different things, gone deer hunting, and now he's been on his own TV show. Uh, this month, you might wonder why I'm staying out here in a drying down field of soybeans. It is fall, you know, we're getting into the fall time of year, which is harvest season. And I just wanted to kind of mention quickly to everybody, I meant to put an article in the paper, but it didn't. But mention to everybody, you know, as farmers get out here and gather their crops, as they, as they combine their, their soybeans, as they dig and pick their peanuts, uh, pick cotton and move modules around, you know, be mindful that all this big, heavy equipment is wide and it is slow. You see them going down the road and they look like they're moving pretty good, but they're moving pretty slow. So when you see that orange triangle on the back of a piece of farm equipment, it means slow moving farm equipment. You know, make sure you start slowing down pretty pretty quick. Um, give them plenty of room to move, plenty of room to turn. Um, like I said, a lot of these pieces of equipment are wide. Um, you know, they might make you a little bit a little bit later getting to your you know getting to your job or getting your kid to school. But just remember, you know, these guys are working hard to provide the food and fiber to clothe you and if you're wearing anything cotton or to feed you you know peanuts soybeans all this stuff so you know, be mindful of that when you're yelling at them when they're, when they're going 15 miles an hour down now 96. Um, but real, the real reason we're here fall you know we're going to talk a little bit about fall gardens about our cool season crops and some things we can do to make those cool season crops perform a little bit better for us this year All right, like I said, it's fall, summer's over. And, you know, from the looks of these tomato plants, we got a few tomatoes left on these vines, but most of these vines are looking pretty rough. Uh, summer's taking its toll. They were probably loaded down with tomatoes. We probably, they probably served hundreds of tomato sandwiches in that house, uh, but summer's definitely over. Um, you know, just got back from Expo, at, you know, the middle part of October, just got, pack, got back from Expo, so fall's definitely here. Um, so what we're going to do this this month, we're going to talk a little bit about hopefully what you've already got planted in your fall or your cool season vegetable garden. Um, I still find it I, I find it very uh, amusing that there's a lot of people who really don't know what we can grow in Georgia in our uh, in in the fall and then again in the spring or uh, you know late winter. Both those gardens can pretty much be the same garden. You know what we can grow here in the fall, we usually can grow in the in late winter, early spring um, because of our mild climate. You know we don't. I know it gets cold in Georgia. We all have jackets and we all get cold at a certain time. We all turn on the heater. But really, if you think about it, you know, South Dakota, North Dakota, they get cold. We don't really get cold here. You know, 20s every once in a while, snow every five years, you know, that's not really cold. So we're going to step over here from the summer garden you know, where you can see all these things kind of fading out. We're going to step right across this PVC pipe into the, the fall or the cool season garden. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, you know, as you can see here, he's got a pretty good size fall garden. First thing I'm going to talk about is what can we grow here in Georgia in the fall. I mean, it's a it's a ton of things that we can grow. I don't like everything we can grow here in the fall, but in the in, in the cooler weather. But there's a lot of things we can grow and a lot of things we can plant this time of year. You know that we will will come off next year. Um, things that we can plant: uh, strawberries. I don't recommend planting strawberries because we got a strawberry patch right there in Reynolds. They grow good strawberries and they got good ice cream. So I don't recommend planting strawberry plants. Just like I don't re recommend planting peaches. You know, let, let, let the Wainwrights <laughs> deal with the headaches of growing peaches. Let them deal with the headaches of strawberries. But if you want to plant strawberries, uh, you can plant strawberries this time of year. You can also plant onions. Sweet onions grow well in our soils here in, in uh, Taylor County and in the fall line area. Uh, we have real sandy soils that are low in sulfur. So you can grow a sweet onion, a Vidalia type onion here. Uh, that's another thing I'd say you probably don't want to grow too many of because we have a 4-H fundraiser 
usually in April or May, where we, we deliver uh, Vidalia onions for our 4 H'ers. Um, so I would recommend just foregoing the onions, buy some from our 4 H'ers, help send them to camp. So there's our two cool season crops that I wouldn't recommend growing for certain reasons. The other things you can grow, um, and I am not gonna be able to tell you exactly what's in these rows exactly, but you can grow kale, you can grow collards, cabbage, uh, mustard, there are all sorts of different types of mustards, uh, rutabagas, you can grow radishes, beets, spinach, all types of lettuce. The only lettuce I would say stay away from would be like your head type, real real firm head type lettuce. You can ro grow romaines and things like that, but, you, but your, your, really, your really tight uh, head lettuces, they just don't do well in Georgia. They do well out in California, out in the west where they don't have rain, they don't have humidity. Um, they don't have bugs. In Georgia, we have rain, we have humidity, those really tight leaves, on those really thin, the really thin leaves, really tight heads, you get a lot of diseases, a lot of things cause those things to rot and, and really just not produce real well. Um, we can grow carrots. We can grow a really good sweet carrot here in the, in, in the south. We can also grow celery, if you like celery. I know not, not a lot of folks around here love, you know, love celery. We can grow celery uh, and we can grow Brussels, spout, Brussels sprouts. Um, so there's a lot of interesting things we can grow, a lot of things we can do in the, in the fall vegetable garden. One thing I feel, failed to mention, I knew after I went through my list, I was gonna to forget to mention one thing. One other thing that you can plant, as, a, as a, I guess as a cool season crop, and usually we, re, we don't recommend doing it this early, but sometime around January, February, you can get some crowns in of asparagus. This is asparagus, um, and you can lay your off a row. Make sure you put it somewhere where, you don't, where you're gonna keep it for, you know, it's a perennial crop, so make sure you put it somewhere either out of the way or, or on the side edge of your garden, or make sure you have a designated spot for it. Because as you, as you can see, after a few years, this is six, year, uh, six years of growth, after a few years, it gets pretty hairy, so uh, make sure you put it, you know, somewhere where you can you can manage it like that. But um, you know, the first year you're gonna have a few spears come up. You know, you don't want to cut them. Second year, probably about the same thing. You know, most people probably cut a few off the second year because they can't hardly stand it. And then really after about the third year, you'll start getting spears that you can cut off. And what you want to do is after you harvest for a few weeks, the first year or the, the first year you harvest. You want to give this plant, this the root crown, some chances to put some put some shoots up like this. You know, let these little leaves get out here, let it grow, let it absorb light, absorb energy, put back in the roots. That's the whole idea behind you know not cutting too much asparagus. You know, early on in its life, and then once you get out into five, six, seven, ten years, you know you've got all this up here putting energy back into that crown, and you're going to have a lot longer harvest. I'm talking to the to the gardener here, three months worth of a. Uh, three months worth of harvest in this, this, this uh, year on this asparagus patch. So that's a lot of asparagus spears. All right, I know, I know that nothing's, just, nothing's easy for everybody, but really growing a fall vegetable uh, garden and growing greens and things like that should be fairly easy for us here in Georgia. Uh, some of the bigger things to deal with, we deal with, I think one thing we deal with all the time is, you know, our, our, our fertilization, and I think we deal with that on any kind of vegetable crop, you know, in the garden, you know, either over or under fertilizing. And I'll touch on that. Um, with a lot of these crops that we grow in the fall, the seed are very small, you know. You go out there and throw a green bean seed in the ground, you, you know, you can kind of mess it up a little bit, put it way too deep, and it'll, it's still gonna come up. It's got a lot of energy in that seed. You know, you get these collards and greens and kale and radish, celery and lettuce, and those seeds are so small that a lot of those you don't even have to put in the ground. A lot of those you can throw, you can kind of lay off your row and put in that row and you can walk down that, that row and step on it and that's deep enough. Sometimes it's too deep. So planting depth is really important. I don't think anything we plant in the fall garden needs to be any deeper than a, you know, a quarter of an inch. A quarter of an inch, that's not very, that's not very deep. So planting depth is very important on these, these small seeds. A lot, of the, a lot of what we get, you know, broccoli, cauliflower, uh, cabbage, a lot of times folks, folks grow that from transplants. So, uh, you know, that, that makes it a lot easier. But these greens like this, leafy greens, rutabagas, turnip, we're gonna grow, a lot of times we're gonna grow those, because we're growing large rows, we're gonna grow those from seed. The other things we have to, hit, we have to uh, deal with here in Georgia, like always, with anything we grow, we gotta deal with insects, we gotta deal with diseases. So I wanna talk a little bit about that, and we'll hit on a few things here. So we're standing here in, in, a, in a leafy green patch. We got some mustard, kale, we got some turnips. Um, like I said, first thing is fertility. You always want to have some good fertility under a, under a crop before you, you know, before you really get going. And the, what I would recommend on greens, which are usually heavy feeders, and when I say heavy feeder, I mean they usually require a pretty good amount of fertilizer to grow and, and be productive. 
Um, I would probably recommend a, a rate of about 500 pounds of, of triple 10, 10, 10, 10 per acre, you know, to go underneath this crop. And when I say underneath it, I mean, I mean when, you get this, when you get this garden ready, you put, say, if, say if you got an acre garden, you put 500 pounds of, of triple 10 out, incorporate it through your tillage, whether it's a, a, a tiller or it's a hara, you know, incorporate that so it's mixed all throughout the soil. So when it, these plants start growing and their soil, their roots start exploring that soil, that fertilizer is there. One thing you need to make sure of is, you know, after you get your soil, soil sample, is you want to make sure that most of your phosphorus, which is that second number in the 10, 10, 10, make sure phosphor, all your phosphorus is in the ground before you plant. Phosphorus doesn't grow, doesn't move in the soil, so if you put phosphorus here, it's not going to go anywhere. It's not doing anything for your plant, you know, if you put it in after after you get these things up and growing and established. So making sure you have your phosphorus there and making sure you have enough fertilizer for that crop to get going and get going and growing well. All right, one other thing that I need to mention with tillage and things, if you do decide to plant something like carrots, if you want to have a carrot that looks like a carrot you buy in a store, which is a long, skinny, pointy, tapered uh, root structure, you need to make sure you have very good tillage. If you use a just a rotary tiller a, a, you know, or even one that pulls behind a tractor, a lot of times you have a layer that's compacted down there. And I live in an area with red clay, hard soil. If I try to grow a carrot, it's gonna be very hard for me to grow a nice pretty carrot like you see in the store. It's gonna look more like a, a sideways growing um, sweet potato or <laughs> some more potato-like. It's gonna be stubby because I have a hard compacted layer down in the soil. And that soil is just very hard, very compact. So make sure if you're gonna grow some carrots, you have a very good you know, very good tillage if you can run something really deep in that area or if you can you know, use some other method of tillage in that area to, uh, to work that soil so that you can get a good, a good root growth. Alright, the next thing we need to talk about, and, and this, is, this is a good garden, uh, a good example to show um, you know, kind of one of our problems we have. We have a real bad problem on our leafy greens because of our humidity, because of our, our rain. We have a real bad problem with three different types of leaf spots and usually it's Cercospora. Usually you know, about this time of year, when you get good growth, um, I start getting phone calls from people about the turnips having white spots on them, and I don't even have to go look at them because it's going to be unless they, you know, they spray herbicide somewhere, it's going to be Cercospora leaf spot or one of the leaf spots. And in the situation like this, unless we have really heavy rains and a lot of it, or a lot of leaf wetness, a lot of dew in the mornings, probably not going to have a problem with it. Where I find the problems is where a lot of folks you know, like to take their, their turnips and they like to broadcast a seed. So you've just got a, 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 a mass or a, basically like a, a lawn of, of turnips. You know, no rows, it's just a broadcast seed bed of turnips. So you just turnips everywhere. Um, that's usually where I see the problem. And the reason we see the problem there, and the reason that we, re we don't recommend planting like that, we plant, recommend planting in rows, a certain space in between the plants, a certain space in between the rows. We recommend that it's nothing more than airflow. I mean, there is some competition issues between plants, but it's mainly airflow on these greens. When you have airflow in this canopy, you get airflow in here. What that does is it lets that plant dry out sooner. If you get a lot of leaf moisture in the morning, a lot of dew, and then it sits there and, and that plant's wet all day because it's, there's plants all around it, there's a better environment for that fungus to grow. So in this environment right here, yeah, you've got some plants side by side, but they've got airflow going side to side. Air can get underneath it, around it. So these leaves will dry out a lot quicker than a planting that's all that's really close together. Um, another thing that can cause the same problem is if you have a lot, a lot of weeds in the garden, um, you're still gonna have that lack of airflow. But this, planted in rows, good space in between the plants. You got a lot of movement of air. You shouldn't have as much problem with Cercospora leaf spot. For those of you that broadcast and have a, a, a mat of, of of uh, leafy greens, you can go in the, out there and start spraying with a fungicide about this time of year. I say that now, if it starts raining about this time of year, but hey, we haven't had rain in a few weeks, so you can start spraying with a fungicide or copper-based fungicide um, as a protective. I always tell people, of course, they never like my answer, that those leaf spots and those holes in those leaves actually make the mustard cook down quicker, so it just saves them time. And you know, you can eat it. It doesn't take make them taste any different. They just look a little bit ugly. So that's, that's a, another one of our big issues. And finally, as always in Georgia, we're gonna have insect problems. And I don't see any real insect problems out here right now, but I've had a lot of people with collards and cabbage that had a lot of problems with insects. And our biggest insect problem on these, uh, on these greens and on cabbage and things 
is going to be caterpillar pests. Our caterpillar pests in, in Georgia are pretty much active year round. I mean, we they slow down in the dead of winter, but right now, I mean, it's it's fall, but it's about 80 degrees. It's warm. It's humid. Um, those caterpillar pests are out right now. We've got diamondback moth, and we've also got cabbage worms, imported cabbage worm. We've got cabbage loopers. We've got a lot of different caterpillar moth type pests. I actually see three flying around out here right now. Most of the time, maybe they'll come up with a pilot camera. Most of the time they're light yellow, uh, kind of greenish white, um, and they will cause all kinds of problems. They'll lay eggs on the underside of these leaves. Um, the caterpillar hatches out, starts feeding, and they'll feed all throughout the winter. Um, and as you can tell from these leaves, I mean, pull this leaf off. I mean, these leaves are curly, crinkly. There's a lot of leaves. And the problem with these pests, usually, one thing, they're hard to kill. But another thing, they're always underneath these leaves. So if you're spraying, I don't care if you spray every day. If you're spraying insecticide every day down this road, if you have low pressure, if you're not getting it underneath that leaf, you're not going to do anything for these pests. Uh, there are some insecticides that will kill them. Uh, and there's one real good one that's uh, registered organic. You know, it's a BT type product. You can buy it at any of your farm and garden places. I believe you can buy it at Payne's. Um, I know, I'm pretty sure it has a product, but it's BT. It's a, it's a toxin produced by a bacteria that only kills caterpillars. So like I said, as long as you're not a caterpillar, you can pretty much drink it and it's not going to hurt you. I wouldn't recommend that, but it's a very safe product. Um, it's only going to kill caterpillars. But once again, you do have to cover the bottom side of the leaf where that caterpillar is feeding. And the caterpillar with that product has to ingest it. It has to eat it. And once it gets in his body, it starts to die. So it's not a real fast. You're not going to spray it and have the caterpillar fall off and you know see him writhing in agony. You know, make you feel better right then. But you know, eventually that caterpillar is going to die, and he's going to be doing less damage, you know, or not doing any more damage to that crop. All right, what we got here is we got a row. We got three rows of onions, probably some sort of Vidalia onion. Um, there's a lot of just one little story about Vidalia, just so you know. There's a lot of different varieties. There's about 50 varieties that are on a list that can be grown as Vidalia onions. Um, but you couldn't grow an onion up here, I don't care what kind it is, and call it a Vidalia. So there's a marketing order, and you have to be a 50 mile radius around Vidalia to actually have a Vidalia onion. Not saying that we can't grow a really, really sweet onion. Like I said earlier, we have really sandy soils, we have low sulfur in our soils. Sulfur is what the main thing in our soils that causes um, pungency in our onions other than some onions that are just pungent to start with. So with onions, you don't want to put a lot of fertilizer out late on them. You want to have a good, good bit of fertilizer, about like what we talked about on the greens, underneath this onion crop. Because what you have to do with this onion is you have to grow a lot of leaf. These are leaves. These round, these little spindly things right now, these are leaves. You need to grow a lot of leaf now, this time of year, up until this stuff, this, this plant goes dormant to really produce a big bulb in the spring. You know, once these things start, start bulbing, uh, mid-April, mid, mid -April, late April, once they start bulbing, you can't put fertilizer out and make them do anything. Um, so what you need to do is have a lot of fertilizer underneath it and then kind of spoon feed it with, say, like a calcium nitrate type fertilizer. You know, it just has calcium and nitrogen, uh, maybe a little potassium, but you don't want to put a complete fertilizer that has sulfur in it throughout the growing season. You know, have a lot of sulfur early, spoon feed it with some calcium nitrate throughout the throughout the growing season keep them good green and healthy don't overdo it if you overdo it on them they become a little less cold hardy and you get a lot of cold injury but get it be get them good and get them good in growth this fall and into the winter and the next next year when they start um, when they start bulbing they'll take the energy out of those leaves and they'll put it back into that bowl another thing you don't have to do especially in this sandy soil is you don't have to remove the dirt you don't have to remove the dirt from the neck as it starts to bulb. It will push that dirt away. You don't have to touch it. And you don't want to plow these things, really. If it gets cold, you don't want to put dirt on them either because that can cause extra injury, extra disease problem. So hopefully, you know, we've kind of talked a little bit about some of the things, you know, you're going, you're going to run into with your fall garden. Hopefully, you've all got your fall garden in the ground that's growing, you know, it's, and it's getting ready to produce. Hopefully, maybe you're already, you know, you're already pulling some turnip greens or some collard greens and getting to eat some of that stuff. Well, that was a lot of information packed into a short short TV show. So maybe maybe you got a little bit out of that. If you didn't, like always, you can call us at our office in Taylor County at the Extension Office, or you can you know send me an email 
at backyard at uga.edu. I'll answer your questions, give you a call back. You know, maybe you can use this information, maybe to make your, your fall vegetable garden, and like I said, your late winter, early spring vegetable garden a little more productive, you have a little more luck with it, or maybe you'll, you'll recognize an issue or a problem that I talked about on this show. And uh, join us next month, which will be December, a good year for soil sampling. We're gonna talk a little bit about soils, give you a soil overview, you know, kind of, that's the building blocks for, for something like this, like our garden or our pecan orchard. Soils are building block, you gotta start with good soil and, uh, and, and healthy soil. So we're gonna talk a little bit about our soils and, and, and some properties of it, characteristics, to maybe make your gardening a little more successful in the future. Well, this is Jeff Cook on Backyard Basics. Like always, we're filmed here in your backyard.